evenings. Good evening. It is so good to be here tonight. I might add, it's so good to be back here tonight. <laughs> it's been a minute. I want to tell you how much joy it is to be here as you, on this night, celebrate the renewal of ministry in this place, the renewal of ministry of the Church of Saints Andrew and Matthew, and install the Reverend Patrick Burke as your rector. We are so proud of him in the Diocese of Indianapolis. And I want to bring you greetings from all of your siblings there in Indiana who rejoice with you on this night. We love Patrick Burke, and we hope that as you come together as rector and congregation, you will discover the extraordinary gifts for ministry and pastoral presence that bore such good and beautiful fruit in our diocese. Now, if I may, I would like to wind the clock back just a little bit. It was not quite a year ago that Patrick and I had a conversation about his discernment towards a new call. And when he mentioned that one of the places he was praying about was the Church of Saints Andrew and Matthew, I might have said just a little too loudly, yes! <laughs> As I had told Patrick, Sam is a special congregation, but the special call that our Episcopal Church needs now more than ever. I have not been a part of this church as a part of your worshiping community, really, but the imprint of this congregation is on my soul. I would not have become a priest without your first rector, Floyd Casson. I would not have flourished as a young priest without the friendship of your second rector, David Andrews. And I would not harbor such deep hope for the church and its future without the man who will become your rector tonight, your third rector, Patrick Burke. Three different rectors and one dynamic, inclusive, Jesus-centered spiritual community steadfast in the pursuit of peace and justice. I don't have the words really to tell you what it means that I've been invited to preach this service tonight. You are imprinted on my soul. A portion of the gospel text read a few minutes ago reads as follows. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now I can understand why this passage might have particular resonance for this church at this moment in time. The harvest is plentiful. By the time Jesus enters and utters these words, he had not only been going about attracting and collecting those in need of God's saving and healing grace, he's been attracting and collecting students, disciples, those who wanted to follow on the way. And as he goes around from town to town, he passes Matthew, the tax collector, follow me, Jesus says, and Matthew follows. He passes by Andrew and Simon Peter, mending their nets, follow me, Jesus says, and the brothers drop their nets and follow. By the time Jesus utters these words, he has assembled his team and he's ready to launch into his ministry. He's ready to go, and the instructions he sends his laborers out into the harvest are clear. We, all these thousands of years later, we so want the harvest to be plentiful. We want it to be plentiful because it's a signal that there is still deep work for us to do as a church, called together to call around, to gather up the least, the lost, the lonely, the secure, the wealthy, the powerful, the able-bodied, the disenfranchised, the differently abled, the neurodivergent, everybody, everybody, everybody. The harvest is plentiful. We're called to gather all of God's beloved so that we might be a connected, community united in God's love. And let's be clear, there is deep work for this church to do in this moment right now. 
But I want to remind you that the harvest, as beautiful as it might look like right here in this sanctuary, this is not the harvest. The harvest is outside. It's all around this neighborhood. It's all around this city. The harvest is all around us. And Jesus is sending you out there into it. And the charism and gift of this congregation particularly is that God has sent you out ahead of a lot of the Episcopal Church to show the rest of us what is possible when you decide. And let's be clear that this is a decision, a discernment, but clearly a decision that you all have made to resist the societal pressures around polarization and homogeneity. And you said, we're going to build the kingdom. We're going to be the kingdom, a community that reflects the fullness of the image of God in all of its beautiful diversity. What would it be like if the Episcopal Church looked like this on a Sunday morning everywhere? I'm just going to say, what would it be like if this is what we look like? The harvest is plentiful, but the examples that look like this one are far too few. So as you renew your ministry and recommit to being the most faithful expression of the body of Christ in this place, I believe, Sam, you have a particular responsibility, and I hope you'll take it, to lead us, to go on ahead of where most of us are now and lead the Episcopal Church to where Jesus needs us to go. We're in a time where white Christian nationalism is on the rise, and so we need churches like this one to lead us where Jesus needs us to go. In a time when the epidemic of loneliness and isolation among the elderly and the young alike is at historic highs, we need you to please lead us to the places where Jesus needs us to go. In a time when the trends of church decline and religious attendance and all of that stuff sounds like such bad news all the time. You look at this and tell me that that's a lie, right? We need churches like this one to lead us where Jesus needs us to go. Jesus has already sent you out to show us what is possible to build up a praying and serving and worshiping, loving community where being known and loved for who you are no matter where you come from or what you look like, what your race, your class, your background, your document status, your sexuality, a group that can hold all of that is doing the work of Jesus. And you hold all of this community together with intentionality, and you do it lovingly, fiercely. You cultivate it, and you protect it. I hope you never take it for granted. This doesn't happen by accident. Let's be clear, it happens with a lot of the Holy Spirit, but it is not by accident. I can't promise you that you will buck every trend that points to the church decline and all of that. I, I can't promise you that it will be easy. I can't promise you that you will always get things right or that you'll never argue amongst yourselves about how to do things. I mean, for church, right? <laughs> like, let's just be real. We're people. But I can promise you that if you stay faithful to how Jesus has called you to be, it will make it much more likely that the generations who are coming up now, that harvest all around you who are not in these pews and in these chairs, it will be more likely that they will see a church that is clear in its commitments to justice and one that looks like the diverse world that they know and live in. And if they see that, they'll be more likely to want to come and see. Because the generations coming up, and you all know this, they don't have time for the stuff that we're doing most of the time, where we're segregated, where we're not committed to making sure that this world has some hope and justice in it, they don't have time. They're not gonna come. And we will not have done what we could do in paying attention to the harvest in our midst. 
So as you're approaching, what, 30 years in your current incarnation? 178 years since the founding of St. Matthew's and 195 years since the founding of St. Andrew's? That's a lot of history. <laughs> and I hope that you have continued to bring the best of who you are and who you have been forward. But as you do so, I hope that you have the ability to kind of cast aside but not forget the historical burdens of colonization and segregation and separation that come with all of that history. Because if you forget it, generations in the future might begin to repeat it. So don't forget it, but use it to write a new story as you go forward. Write a new story as congregations coming together in the spirit of reconciliation that is at the very heart of Christ's mission for the church. This is the way. It is the hope for our denomination. May tonight truly mark a renewal in this house of prayer. And for all those whom you gather in the name of Jesus, may you continue to be a community of Jesus followers that is regularly transformed by God in worship that is as glorious as it is tonight. And then get out of here. Use that charism to be sent out into the world, onto the corner, down the road, to be a part of transforming this world that needs you, needs you in the way that you know how to be church. And may you be faithfully led by Father Patrick and your lay leaders into the city of Wilmington and beyond, shining the light of Christ wherever you go. I know it's not been an easy road to get here. Anybody, any church that survived the pandemic and is still hoping has done an amazing thing, because not everybody made it. But here you are. You've been faithful, hardworking, and centered in God's love in Christ. And you have called this priest who is most meant to share this leg of the journey with you. It won't be like it was in the past, but you can write a new story together for the future. Now, I realize I've taken a few personal privileges already, but I want to ask you to indulge one more, if you would, as I address you, your new rector. Patrick, so much has changed since I ordained you to the priesthood just over five years ago. You have been a truth-telling, bridge-building, and collaborative pastoral leader, all of the gifts that so many identified in you years ago. But what has not changed is my prayer for you, I like to believe that everybody remembers every sermon I ever preached, so you, I, you know, you're going to remember these words, right, <laughs> from the sermon when I ordained you. This was the prayer, with a minor adaptation, that you would continue to grow more deeply into the life of sacramental and pastoral ministry, and that wherever this call takes you, into the next subdivision or across the world or somewhere in between like Delaware, <laughs> that in whatever context, however your vocation evolves, you will continue to call us to be fully awake and alive to the places where God is to be found, which is everywhere, and especially among those who are hidden in plain sight. Please continue to evolve and be that priest. Amen. Now let us pray. The harvest is plentiful, and because, O oh God, you have been faithful and have answered our prayers, the laborers are many. We are here. We have seen, tasted, and experienced the harvest in its beautiful diversity, and yet there is more. Send us to places you need your church to go. Your church, this church, this congregation is ready. Amen. Amen.